Good morning. It's so good to be with all of you today in person. And uh, good to be with all of you who are joining uh, remotely via YouTube. Um, I just want to start <clears throat> message today by saying that I do not have the gift of prophecy. I, I can't tell if there are confused faces because you're all wearing masks, so let me explain for a minute. Um, a couple of weeks ago, my sister Sue, back there, um, she texted me with a bunch of pictures of neckties. She said, Chris, we're cleaning out the closet in your old room, and here are all the ties we found. Do you want any of these? Um, I looked at the pictures, I'm like, okay, well, some of these belong to my dad, so they're probably older than me. And I'm just like looking through, and there's one that was just a simple black necktie. I'm like, all right, you know, I, th I think that, that black one, that, that'll be fine. So we finished texting, and then my wife Stephanie asks me, oh, what was that about? So I explained to her, I said, yeah, I'm going to take the one black necktie because it's so versatile. You could wear it like almost anything. You know, it's, it's really, you know, I, I really like a black tie. Um, but realistically, the way everything's going, the fact that my office probably isn't going to open until maybe Memorial Day, none of my clients are having meetings, so much of church is remote. I said, realistically, I don't foresee any circumstances in the next year where I'd wind up wearing a tie. A week later, <laughs> so I don't have the gift of prophecy. Um, so today, um, <coughs> I'm going to read a passage uh, though, describing a miracle that Jesus performed on his way to Jerusalem shortly before his death and resurrection. Um, it's a short passage, but there's a lot packed into it that teaches us about what thankfulness to God looks like. So I think that this is appropriate in, in the weeks prior to Thanksgiving. Um, so just like Christmas and Fourth of July, Memorial Day, or Veterans Day this, this last week, it can be so hard to engage with the meaning of a holiday as we go about our, our daily lives. Uh, George Washington proposed the idea of Thanksgiving, a Thanksgiving holiday, shortly after he became president. This was in October 1789 in a presidential address. He said, in part, that a holiday should be instituted to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be, that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks. Thanksgiving didn't become an official US holiday until um, many years later, 1863, um, when Abraham Lincoln made it an official holiday. And I think it's important to remember also that the circumstances under which he instituted Thanksgiving, we're in the middle of a civil war, families fighting against families and states against states, people dying every day. And he said, this is the time that we need to seek God and give him thanks. And I think it's, it's, it's well worth it um, to go back and read those full addresses from, from George Washington and from Abraham Lincoln. It's very instructive. Um, it's not easy to be thankful. Thankfulness is so often a simple formality or social convention. Um, and unfortunately, it can also devolve into something like a throwaway line. Uh, we might reflexively say thank you to the guy who fills up our gas tank or the cashier at the grocery store, the Amazon delivery driver. Um, and my standard professional sign-off is something like, on my emails is something like, thank you and please let me know if you have any further questions. Really, I don't want them to come to me with further <laughs> questions and usually if someone's emailing me, they want for something for me, so I'm not really thankful that they reached out to me for something. But um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not, thankfulness is something that can be in short supply both in the world and, and in our hearts. Um, and it might be very fashionable to blame this on the consumerism of an affluent society, the influence of the media, or the distractions that come from mobile apps, tablets, phones, television, streaming services. And while those all might play a role, the passage we're going to read in just a little bit makes it clear to us that the ingratitude of the human heart predates any of those factors. 
We talk about true thankfulness to God. It's not a formality or a throwaway line. It's the posture of our hearts. So three parts I'm, I'm going to talk about today are, are um, from this, this passage. It's Luke 17, 11 through 19. First, the compassion of Jesus. Second, the response to Jesus' compassion. And then our own thankfulness. Um, so as I read, keep in mind, it's, it's helpful to remember this is a true historical account at a real time and real place in history. These were real people who approached Jesus with a life-altering problem. So Luke 17, 11 through 19. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So first, let's look at the compassion of Jesus. It's hard to be thankful in the first century AD. You wouldn't have had a refrigerator, and if you did, it wouldn't be very full. There was no ice cream, there was no coffee, I would have had a very hard time. Seasonal vegetables was a redundant term because there were no other type of vegetables, it was just what was in season. And if you were on the keto diet, it probably wasn't by choice. They didn't have a TV, they didn't have phones, they had no say in choosing their civic leaders, so they didn't even get to experience the joy of participating in an election. To understand the work of Jesus in this passage, it's helpful to understand the burden of leprosy that these men faced in the first century. So let's jump back to the Old Testament to gain some insight into the world of these 10 men who met Jesus in the wilderness. From Leviticus 13, uh, verse 45. Leviticus 13, 45. Suppose someone has a skin disease that makes them unclean. Then they must wear torn clothes. They must let their hair hang loose. They must cover the lower part of their face. They must cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. There's some debate about whether the condition that we know today as leprosy was the same one that the Bible refers to. The Old Testament refers frequently to leprosy. The New Testament refers to leprosy. Um, I'm not up to date on what the current thinking is as to whether that disease was the one we know as leprosy today, but that's not really what's important in this passage. Here's what's important. Leprosy separated a man from his community. It made him unclean. In fact, leprosy was so tied to the concept of uncleanness that most of the time in the Bible, when we hear about, we read about the healing of a leper, we don't read, oh, and the leper was healed. We read, and he was cleansed. Practically, uncleanness meant that their particip participation in the community and with their families was cut off. It was a severe form of social isolation. And even though we're separated from these lepers by 2,000 years of history, and 5,000 miles of distance, we are not too different from them. Disease remains a primal trigger for us. After 2,000 years of medicine and science, the world is still fallen. We still get sick. Our bodies are still mortal. The last 200 years of technological innovation, phones, internet, Zoom, YouTube, mobile apps, doesn't replace seeing our loved ones face to face. Zoom can't give you a hug or let you hug your best friend. Your grandson can't sit on your lap over FaceTime. So when we see these lepers sick and isolated, 
let's try to see ourselves. Even if someone was healed of leprosy, the priest had to go outside to meet them and verify that they were healed. If he was, then there was a very involved process in declaring him to be clean, including sacrificing a bird and sprinkling the blood. So leprosy was a serious impediment to social life in first century Israel. And it was even worse than uh, what we're going through today. It's worse than the social distancing that governments have mandated over the last eight months. Um, so when these 10 men approach Jesus, we notice that they stand at a distance as the Levitical law requires them to do. And they call out with a loud voice. They are unclean and Jesus is the cleanest person who ever lived. But instead of shouting unclean as a warning, they call out for mercy. Jesus does not immediately heal them, but tells them to show themselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. That's the compassion of Jesus for these men. So let's now look at the response to Jesus' compassion. Of the ten who were healed, only one returns to Jesus. And his reaction to his healing is instructive for all of us. Now that we've established we're not really so different from these people 2,000 years ago. So first, he glorifies God. There's a parallelism here. At first, he calls out to a loud voice, with a loud voice, asking for mercy. And now he calls out in a loud voice, this time not because he's far off and he needs Jesus to heal him, but because he has a need welling up in his heart to glorify God. This is a very common response to healing in the New Testament. Matthew 9, Luke 5, Mark 2. Um, we, we, we all have, um, we have the parallel accounts of Jesus healing a paralyzed man who was lowered down through a roof. The Matthew account reads, They were all so amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. In Luke 5 of that same account, the man lowered down from the roof. They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear, saying, We have, never, we have seen remarkable things today. In Matthew 15, 31, Jesus heals... Um, uh, <clears throat> after Jesus heals many blind, mute, and paralyzed people that the crowds were bringing to him, um, the crowds marveled and said, it says they glorified the God of Israel. In Luke 7, 16, God, Jesus raises a man from the dead and Luke writes, fear gripped them all and they began glorifying God saying, a great prophet has arisen among us and God has visited his people. And in John eleven four. 4, before Jesus raises Lazarus, he says that Lazarus' illness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God. Glorifying God consists of recognizing him for who he is, giving him the weight that he deserves in our lives. Like the crowds in these other passages, this Samaritan who comes back astonished is marveling. He sees the remarkable thing has happened to him. The second thing, so first, the first in the response is he glorifies God. Second, he humbles himself. When that happens, he recognizes God for who he is and assigns God his rightful place in his life. This next step is inevitable. He falls down at the feet of Jesus. It's a sign of humility, um, a Greek word um, uh, meaning to descend from a higher place to a lower one. There's a realignment of the heart as he understands Jesus' place relative to his own. He's no longer the lowest member of society. As a leper, he was an outcast. Now he's not anymore. He's not the lowest member of society. He's reintegrated. He's, he's made whole again. But it hasn't made him proud. And now he voluntarily humbles himself before his healer. And finally, he gives thanks. The Samaritan's thankfulness consists not just in words, it's a thankfulness that originates from his heart, from a correct understanding of God's place. And it's a realignment that for us will continue happening until we're there in heaven with him. It's easy to ask Jesus for what we want. It's so easy that I'm guessing most of us probably do it subconsciously. And that's not a bad thing. In fact, it's a great place to be. It shows an understanding of our need and a recognition that Jesus could meet those needs. 
which is true. But it's so easy to forget to give thanks for all that we have, to give thanks even for our deliverance. It's so easy to grumble like the Israelites in Exodus 16. Why did you deliver us from Egypt? But do you think that anything that happened to this guy after he was healed in Luke 17 was going to bring him down? If there was a long line at the fish market or wherever he was, is that going to bother him? If it rained while he's on his way to go show the priest, is he going to care? If he, in his haste, trips and skins his knee and stubs his toe, the pain of doing that would be the very indication that his leprosy had left him. Jesus finishes the passage, though, by asking a question. Were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Jesus leaves us hanging. He's omniscient. He knows all. He knows the answer to that question. It's rhetorical. But we don't get an answer to it in that passage. So finally, let's look at our own hearts and our own thankfulness. This is a true account. Those nine other men were just as real as we are. And even though we don't know how the story continued for them, we should ask how our story is going to continue. I'm going to guess that no one here has been healed of leprosy. But we don't have to be. If we are in Christ, we have been cleansed been cleansed of our pride, our anger, our selfishness, our addictions. Our gratitude toward God is a good diagnostic test of our relationship with him. Consider this. Earlier I said, thank you is just like a common courtesy. It could be like a throwaway line. You know, it's like a formality. You know, Get your change at the grocery store. Maybe not today. You don't use change because it has germs on it or something. But, you know, uh, you're, whatever. You, you, you do the thing with the phone like this. You say, okay, yeah, here's a receipt. Thank you. And it's just a word. It's just out and gone. We don't write a thank you note to that cashier for giving us the change or whatever. He, the cashier owes you that. It's part of the transaction. The guy at the McDonald's drive through you know, he's, he gets your order right. Oh, th thanks for getting the order right. Like, I, I truly appreciate that. It's, it's, part of, it's part of the transaction. It's baked in. He owes that to you. Or a driver that stops for you at the crosswalk. It, yeah, thanks. You know, but you're, you're going to forget about that. Although maybe in, in New Jersey, especially if you're like in Dover or something, maybe they don't stop for you in the crosswalk. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but you, you, might, you might say like a thank you at a common courtesy, but it ends there. Um, and in the background, we're still thinking about oh, my job search. I got to finish that resume, or um, oh yeah, um, you know, the car needs an oil change. I got to get on that, or um, oh man, like how many months has it been? When am I going to be able to, you know, go and see people again and get out of my house? And that's it. But if we forget to thank God, or if we thank Him only half-heartedly, as if He passed you the salt on Thanksgiving then our hearts could use some realigning. Most of the time, I'm not the Samaritan in this passage. Most of the time, honestly, I'm one of the nine. Feeling like I'm owed something. Feeling like I'm entitled. All we were entitled to was condemnation. Just as leprosy separated those men from their communities and forced them to stay far off from Jesus, our sin separated us from God. We are all, we're all lepers who were estranged from our Father. And like leprosy, our sin was incurable until the Son of God stepped into our story. He bore our spiritual leprosy so that we didn't have to be expelled. He was expelled from the community, taken outside the camp and declared unclean. And it is by his wounds that we have been healed. He stepped into our story and he forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases, which are just as severe today as for those 10 men who ran through the wilderness to see Jesus 2,000 years ago. So as we look forward to Thanksgiving, let's be mindful of these gifts. Let's glorify God by giving him weight in our lives, assigning to him his rightful place 
and declaring our gratitude not only for the gift of salvation, but also for our daily blessings. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. There are so many things that we cannot even list the blessings that you have provided for us. We thank you most of all for intervening in our story, for approaching us when we were unclean and cut off, separated from you. Enemies declared enemies of you, and you approached us to make us clean. We thank you so much for that. We pray that you would impress it on our hearts, that it would inform everything that we do, that it would filter out in our lives, through us, to the people who we know at work and in our families and our neighbors in our communities. We pray that our thankfulness would be a witness to them, uh, that they would see that we are set apart, sanctified, a holy people unto you, so that you may receive glory as more people praise your name. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask. Amen. Amen.